What's up you scholars of the Enlightenment you? Welcome back to the channel. I'm just finishing up a video on the Ralph Northam controversy over in the United States. But in the meantime, while you're waiting for that, I thought I'd share another science comedy gig that I did. This time it's a science slam, which is run by a bunch of German guys who take it around Europe. And it's a vehicle for PhD students and master's students to explain their scientific research using comedy. So it's to make things accessible, more interesting, more exciting, and get people involved who might be interested in science but wouldn't necessarily go to a lecture um, or anything a bit more formal. So mine's on particle physics, a um, few digs in there at the Germans. So I hope you enjoy it and here we go. and I'm a high energy particle physicist here at the University of Cambridge and at the LHC, or as my flatmate prefers to call it, currently single. So <laughs> I'm going to tell you a little bit about particle physics and answer to you the question, why do we even exist? Um, but first of all, I want to welcome our German friends. It's fantastic to be involved with the Science Lab, a fantastic uh, science comedy evening that's expanding out of Germany. Because it's great to be breaking down stereotypes. But as Brits, we don't really associate often the Germans with good comedy. And uh, historically, Germans expanding into Europe and Germans sending, Germans sending a sign is something that us Brits have had to worry about, not laugh about. So it's nice to be saying something straight. It's also nice to be talking about physics right here in the fountain, a venue that seems to transcend all physical laws of space and time given that it's a pub in the centre of Cambridge that's open after 11 o'clock on a Thursday night. In, in case you don't know, there's also a great deal of science done here in the, uh, in the fountain. Every Friday night by the emer uh, Medical Emergency Services and also by the Cambridge Constabulary Forensic Unit. So this really is a great place to be talking about high-level science, in case you didn't know. Um, I'd like to throw something out there as well. If you're confused at any point in the set, it's a set about physics and maths, we're in a bar. So remember, you're not in a lecture, you're in a pub. So please feel free to, uh, to frequent the bar. Nice picture of Schrodinger's cat. So, also, I'd like, to alleviate, <laughs> I'd like to alleviate a little worry that you might have that there'll be lots of maths in this set. Um, is there anyone in the audience who, for them, maths gives them a kind of creeping sense of dread? Yeah. So we're going to stay away from the maths, I think. I've got Michael B. Here's the equation of my PhD. It's called the standard model. Um, yeah, I've been doing P uh, PhD for about four years, and I don't have a fucking clue what that means. So we're just going to move on. And we're going to take a more practical approach to the mathematics in this set. And I'm going to tell you why particle physics is like Lego, because everyone likes Lego. And I'm going to sneak the science in round the back, like a L'Oreal kind of shampoo commercial. You know, while you're looking at pictures of Jennifer Aniston's hair, boom, here comes the science. Um, so particle physics is all about finding the smallest building blocks of the universe, and working out the IKEA uh, instruction manual for how they fit together. <laughs> so from high school physics, you probably know that all the matter around us is made of atoms, protons and neutrons with electrons whizzing around the outside. Uh, but what if we want to look for smaller units underneath? How do we do that? Well, when we look at something intricate like a watch or a clock, we take the bits apart and we see how they fit together to make a whole. With atoms, we can't actually do that. The clock is too small. We can't get the screwdriver in. So what do we do? We smash the clock over the head and we see the bits that come out and how they fit together. And that's exactly what we do with the Large Hadron Collider. Now, if that seems a little bit complicated, I'd like to give you some takeaway analogies from tonight. And the first one is particle physics. Now, particle physics is just like sex, which is really handy because when you study it, it tends to be the thing that it replaces. Um, but seriously, particle physics is just like sex. Initially, you have no idea what you're doing or what you're looking for. So how do you start? Well, you, stand by, you start by randomly smashing things back and forward, desperately hoping for the explosion you're looking for, which is exciting, but one way or the other, over far too quickly. The whole process involves a lot of trial and error. And the inevitable consequences are just a set of results that need to be cleaned up by a stack full of paper. <laughs> so physics, particle physics is like sex. 
And once we finish all this sexual experimentation, we have these Lego building blocks made by the entire universe. Um, and we can understand structures on any level using them. We can go from the very small, like the atom, bacteria, or the UK science budget, all the way up to the very large, like planets, galaxies, or John Prescott with his pipe. Um, but there's a little fly in the ointment, and this is what I work on in my PhD, and it's a thing called antimatter. It's basically an evil twin of each of these building blocks. So the electron, for example, which is negative, has a, a positive positron, which is its, its antiparticle, so, which is uh, these lovely pictures of the Olsen twins. Um, and this isn't just theoretical. Uh, it's not just the realm of Star Trek. This is actually used in real-world applications. You heard about the PET scanner earlier, the positron emission tomography scanner. And this actually gives us a really big problem. Because our cosmological models insist that just after the Big Bang, there were equal amounts of antimatter and matter. But does anyone know what happens when equal amounts of matter and antimatter meet? That's right. Um, Tom Hanks gets <laughs> slated at the box office. But also, they annihilate to produce only light. So in today's universe, if we started with equal amounts, we should not exist. Only light should exist. So how does uh, God, or as we call him Brian, um, get around this problem? Well, he institutes this idea of CP violation in particle physics. Now, CP violation isn't something George Michael does in an LA toilet. It's not something, uh, it's not something Jordan can do with her teeth, and it doesn't invoke a mandatory four-year prison sentence. CP violation is actually just any difference between matter and antimatter. So if we start with equal amounts of matter and antimatter, and we have a difference in their decay rates, we can start to get a little imbalance in the early universe through this CP violation. Now when slightly unequal amounts of matter and antimatter meet, you have a little bit of matter left over from that excess, and lots of light. And that's happily the universe that we can survive and live in today. Unfortunately, not all problems are solved. Um, but it at least means that we can uh, survive in this universe. So what do I actually do as a particle physicist? Well, at the LHC, we smash two protons together, and this produces kind of a, a mini Big Bang. It produces equal amounts of particles and antiparticles. So these are the, exactly the conditions that we had just after the Big Bang, explosive and fiery, kind of like a Friday night in here. Um, and then I can look at the, um, how these uh, populations of particles and antiparticles evolve over time. And if one disappears quicker than the other, then I can say there's a difference in their decay rates. And I can say I found a source of CP violation and maybe help to explain why the universe evolved to its current state. So what have I found? Um, well, the previous best measurement of CP violation for the channels that I look at, and the slides have obviously messed up a little bit, was that there is no CP violation in my channel with an error of 1%. So there's a 1% error of whether there might be some or there might not be. Now, after four years of research, tens of thousands of pounds, and two failed relationships, what have I found? CP violation is zero, plus or minus 0.6%. But I have the world's best measurement of nothing. <laughs> Which is something to be proud of. My supervisor is very happy with this. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't help me to get become a doctor. Uh, and there's a nice picture of Dr. Dre, PhD. <laughs> um, so second takeaway analogy. So you've taken away that um, particle physics is like sex. I want you to take away that antimatter is like ex-girlfriends. So like my ex-girlfriends. You don't see an awful lot of it about nowadays. It doesn't hang around very long. And it reacts violently when brought into contact with its former partner. It certainly works very well for any relationship I've ever been in. So this is what I want you to take away. Take away that particle physics is like sex, because you'll remember it, and take away that these properties of antimatter, because they're like X relationships. So basically, anything in particle physics is just about dealing with the, the fairer sex. If only Albert had known this back in his day, then I think the 20th century might have been much easier. So anyway, it's probably time for me to go, because like the great particle physicist Steve McQueen before me, I don't want to have to be chased off by the Germans. <laughs> <laughs>